Miss Harriet by Guy de Maupassant. There were seven of us on a drag, four women and three men. One of the latter sat on the box seat beside the coachman. We were ascending at a snail's pace, the winding road up the steep cliff along the coast. Setting out from Etrat at the break of day in order to visit the ruins of Tankerville, we were still half asleep, benumbed by the fresh air of the morning. The women especially, who were little accustomed to these early excursions, half opened and closed their eyes at every moment, nodding their heads or yawning, quite insensible to the beauties of the dawn. It was autumn. On both sides of the road stretched the bare fields, yellowed by the stubble of wheat and oats which covered the soil like a beard that had been badly shaved. The moist earth seemed to steam. Larks were singing high up in the air while other birds piped in the bushes. The sun rose at length in front of us, bright red on the plain of the horizon, and in proportion of it as it ascended, growing clearer from minute to minute, the country seemed to awake, to smile, to shake itself like a young girl leaving her bed in her white robe of vapor. The Comte de Trail, who was seated on the box, cried, Look! Look! A hare! And he extended his arm towards the left, pointing to a patch of clover. The animal scurried along, almost hidden by the clover, only its large ears showing. Then it swerved across a furrow, stopped, and started off again at full speed, changed its course, stopped anew, uneasy and spying out at every every danger, uncertain what route to take, when suddenly it began to run with great bounds, disappearing finally in a large patch of beetroot. All the men had waked up to watch the course of the animal. René Laminoir exclaimed, "'We're not all gallant this morning,' and regarding his neighbor, the little Baroness de Serenz, who struggled against sleep, he said to her in a low tone, "'You are thinking of your husband, Baroness. Reassure yourself. He will not return before Saturday, so you still have four days.' She answered with a sleepy smile, "'How stupid you are!' Then, shaking off her torpor, she added, "'Now let somebody say something to make us laugh. "'You, Monsieur Chanel, who have the reputation of having had more love affairs than the Duke de Richelieu, Tell us a love story in which you've played a part. Anything you like. Leon Chanel, an old painter who'd once been very handsome and very strong, and very proud of his physique, and very popular with women, took his long white beard in his hand and smiled. Then, after a few moments' reflection, he suddenly became serious. Ladies, it will not be an amusing tale, for I'm going to relate to you the saddest love affair of my life, and I sincerely hope that none of my friends may ever pass through a similar experience. I was 25 years of age and was pillaging along the coast of Normandy. I call pillaging wandering about, with a knapsack on one's back from inn to inn, under the pretext of making studies and sketching landscapes. I knew nothing more enjoyable than the happy-go-lucky wandering life, in which one is perfectly free without shackles of any kind, without care, without preoccupation, without thinking even of the morrow. One goes in any direction one pleases without any guide save his fancy, without any counselor save his eyes. One stops because a running brook attracts one, because the smell of potatoes frying tickles one's olfactories on passing an inn. Sometimes it's the perfume of clematis which decides one in his choice, or the roguish glance of the servant at an inn. Do not despise me for my affection for these rustics. These girls have a soul as well as senses, not to mention firm cheeks and fresh lips, while their hearty and willing kisses have the flavor of wild fruit. Love is always love come whence it may. A heart that beats at your approach, an eye that weeps when you go away, are things so rare, so sweet, so precious, that they must never be despised. I have had rendezvous in ditches full of primroses behind the cow stable and in barns and among the straw, still warm from the heat of the day. I have recollections of coarse gray cloth covering supple peasant skin and regrets for simple frank kisses, more delicate in their unaffected sincerity than the subtle favors of charming and distinguished women. But what one loves most amid all these varied adventures is the country, the woods, the rising of the sun, the twilight and the moonlight. These are for the painter honeymoon trips with nature. One is alone with her in that long and quiet association. You go to sleep in the fields, amid marguerites and poppies, and when you open your eyes in the full glare of the sunlight, you decry in the distance the little village with its pointed clock tower which sounds the hour of noon. You sit down by the side of a spring which gushes out at the foot of an oak, amid a growth of tall slender weeds glistening with life. You go down on your knees and bend forward and drink that cold pellucid water which wets your mustache and nose. You drink it with a physical pleasure, 
as though you kissed the spring lip to lip. Sometimes when you find a deep hole along the course of these tiny brooks, you plunge in quite naked, and you feel on your skin from head to foot, as it were, an icy and delicious caress, the light and gentle quivering of the stream. You're gay on the hills, melancholy in the edge of ponds, inspired when the sun is setting in an ocean of blood-red clouds and casts red reflections on the river. And at night, under the moon which passes across the vault of heaven, you think of a thousand strange things which would have never occurred to your mind under the brilliant light of day. So, in wandering through the same country where we are this year, I came to the little village of Benoville, on the cliff between Yport and Etrat. I came from Pecamp, following the coast, a high coast as straight as a wall with its projecting chalk cliffs descending perpendicularly to the sea. I'd walked since early morning on the short grass, smooth and yielding as a carpet that grows on the edge of a cliff. And, singing lustily, I walked with long strides, looking sometimes at the slow circling flight of a gull with its white curved wings outlined on the blue sky, sometimes at the brown sails of a fishing bark on the green sea. In short, I'd passed a happy day, a day of liberty and of freedom from care. A little farmhouse where travelers were lodged was pointed out to me, a kind of inn, kept by a peasant woman which stood in the center of a Norman courtyard surrounded by a double row of beeches. Leaving the coast, I reached the hamlet which was hemmed in by great trees, and I presented myself at the house of Mother Le Cature. She was an old, wrinkled, and stern peasant woman, who seemed always to receive customers under protest with a kind of defiance. It was the month of May. The spreading apple trees covered the court with a shower of blossoms, which rained unceasingly both upon people and upon the grass. Well, Madame Le Cature, do you have a room for me? Astonished to find that I knew her name, she answered, Well, that depends. Everything is let, but all the same I can find out. In five minutes we'd come to an agreement, and I deposited my bag upon the earthen floor of a rustic room, furnished with the bed, two chairs, a table, and a wash bowl. The room looked into a large, smoky kitchen where the lodgers took their meals with the people of the farm and the landlady, who was a widow. I washed my hands, after which I went out. The old woman was making a chicken fricassee for dinner, in the large fireplace which hung the iron pot, black with smoke. "'You have travelers, then, at the present time,' I said to her. She answered in an offended tone of voice. "'I have a lady, an English lady, who has reached years of maturity. She occupies the other room. I obtained, by means of an extra five sous a day, the privilege of dining alone out in the yard when the weather was fine. My place was set outside the door, and I was beginning to gnaw the lean limbs of the Normandy chicken and to drink the clear cider and to munch the hunk of white bread, which was four days old, but excellent.' Suddenly the wooden gate which gave on the highway was opened, and a strange lady directed her steps toward the house. She was very thin, very tall, and so tightly enveloped in a red scotch plaid shawl that one might have supposed she had no arms, if one had not seen a long hand appear just above the hips, holding a white tourist umbrella. Her face was like that of a mummy, surrounded with curls of gray hair which tossed about at every step she took, and made me think, I know not why, of a pickled herring in curl papers. Lowering her eyes, she passed quickly in front of me and entered the house. That singular apparition cheered me. She undoubtedly was my neighbor, the English lady of mature age of whom our hostess had spoken. I did not see her again that day. The next day, when I had settled myself to commence painting at the end of that beautiful valley, which you know and which extends as far as it trots, I perceived, on lifting my eyes suddenly, something singular standing on the crest of a cliff. One might have said a pole ducked out with flags. It was she. On seeing me, she suddenly disappeared. I re-entered the house at midday for lunch and took my seat at the general table, so as to make the acquaintance of this odd character. But she did not respond to my polite advances, and was insensible even to my little attentions. I poured out water for her persistency, and passed her the dishes with great eagerness. A slight, almost imperceptible movement of the head, and an English word murmured so low that I did not understand it, were her only acknowledgments. I ceased occupying myself with her, although she had disturbed my thoughts. At the end of three days, I knew about as much about her as did Madame Le Cachure herself. She was called Miss Harriet. Seeking out a secluded village in which to pass the summer, she had been attracted to Benoville some six months before, and did not seem disposed to leave it. She never spoke at table, ate rapidly, reading all the while a small book of the Protestant propaganda. She gave a copy of it to everybody. The cure himself had received no less than four copies, conveyed by an urchin to whom she'd paid two sous commission. 
She said sometimes to our hostess abruptly without preparing her in the least for the declaration, I love the Savior more than all. I admire him in all creation. I adore him in all nature. I carry him always in my heart. And she would immediately present the old woman with one of her tracts, which were destined to convert the universe. In the village, she was not liked. In fact, the schoolmaster, having pronounced her an atheist, a kind of stigma attached to her. The cure, who had been consulted by Madame Le, Le Cachure, responded, Oh, she's a heretic, but God does not wish the death of the sinner, and I believe her to be a person of pure morals. These words, atheist, heretic, words in which no one can precisely define, threw doubts into some minds. It was asserted, however, that this Englishwoman was rich, and she'd passed her life in traveling through every country in the world because her family had cast her off. Why had her family cast her off? Well, because of her impiety, of course. She was, in fact, one of those people of exalted principles, one of those opinionated Puritans of which England produces so many, one of those good and insupportable old maids who haunt the tables d'hôte of every hotel of Europe, who spoil Italy and poison Switzerland, render the charming cities of the Mediterranean uninhabitable, carry everywhere their fantastic manias, their manners of petrified vestals, their indescribable toilets, and a certain odor of India rubber, which makes one believe that at night they are slipped into a rubber casing. Whenever I caught sight of one of these individuals in a hotel, I fled like the birds who see a scarecrow in a field. This woman, however, appeared so very singular that she did not displease me. Madame Le Cachure, hostile by instinct to everything that was not rustic, felt in her narrow soul a kind of hatred for the ecstatic declarations of the old maid. She'd found a phrase by which to describe her, a term of contempt that rose to her lips, called forth by a know-not-what, confused and mysterious mental ratissonation. She said, That woman is a demoniac. This epithet applied to that austere and sentimental creature seemed to me irresistibly droll. I, never, I myself never called her anything now but the demoniac, experiencing a singular pleasure in pronouncing aloud this word on perceiving her. One day I asked Mother Le Cachure, Well, what is our demoniac about to today? To which my rustic friend replied with a shocked air, well, What do you think, sir? She picked up a toad which had its paw crushed and carried it to her room and has put it in her wash basin and bandaged it as if it were a man. If that is not profanation, I should like to know what is. On another occasion, when walking along the shore, she bought a large fish which had just been caught, simply to throw it back into the sea again. The sailor from whom she would bought it, although she paid him handsomely, now began to swear more exasperated, indeed, than if she'd put her hand into his pocket and taken his money. For more than a month he could not speak of the circumstance without becoming furious and denouncing it as an outrage. Oh yes, she was indeed a demoniac, this Miss Harriet, and Mother Le Cachure must have had an inspiration in thus christening her. The stable boy, who was called Sapur because he had served in Africa in his youth, entertained other opinions. He said with a roguish air, Oh, she's just an old hag who's seen life. If the poor woman had but known. The little kind-hearted Celeste did not wait upon her willingly, but I was never able to understand why. Probably her only reason was that she was a stranger of another race, of a different tongue and of another religion. She was, in fact, a demoniac. She passed her time wandering about the country, adoring and seeking God in nature. I found her one evening on her knees in a cluster of bushes. Having discovered something red through the leaves, I brushed aside the branches, and Miss Harriet at once rose to her feet, confused at having been found thus, fixing on me terrified eyes like those of an owl surprised in open day. Sometimes when I was working among the rocks, I would suddenly descry her on the village of a cliff like a lighthouse signal. She'd be gazing in rapture at the vast sea, glittering in the sunlight, and the boundless sky with its golden tints. Sometimes I'd distinguish her at the end of her valley, uh, walking quickly with her elastic English step, and I would go toward her, attracted by I know not what, well, simply to see her illuminated visage, her dried-up ineffable features, which seemed to glow with inward and profound happiness. I would often encounter her also in the corner of a field, sitting on the grass under the shadow of an apple tree, with her little religious booklet lying open on her knee while she gazed out at the distance. I could not tear myself away from that quiet country neighborhood to which I was attached by a thousand links of love for its wide and peaceful landscape. I was happy in this sequestered farm, far removed from everything, but in touch with the earth, the good, beautiful green earth. And must I avow it? There was besides a little curiosity which retained me at the residence of Mother Le Cachure. 
I wish to become acquainted with this little with this strange Miss Harriet, and to know what transpires in the solitary souls of those wandering old English women. We became acquainted in a rather singular manner. I had just finished a study which appeared to be me to be worth something, and so it was, as it sold for ten thousand francs fifteen years later. It was as simple, however, as two and two make four, and was not according to academic rules. The whole right side of my canvas represented a rock, an enormous rock, covered with sea rack, brown and yellow and red, across which the sun poured like a stream of oil. The light fell upon the rock as though it were a flame without the sun, which was at my back being visible. That was all. A first bewildering study of blazing, gorgeous light. On the left was the sea, not the blue sea and the slate-colored sea, but a sea of jade, greenish, milky, and solid beneath a deep-colored sky. I was so pleased with my work that I danced from sheer delight as I carried it back to the inn. I would have liked the whole world to see it at once. I can remember that I showed it to a cow that was browsing by the wayside, exclaiming as I did so, Look at that, my old beauty. You will not often see its like again. When I had reached the house, I immediately called out to Mother Le Cachour, shouting with all my might. Hello there, Mrs. Landlady. Come here. Take a look at this. The rustic approached and looked at my work with her stupid eyes, which distinguished nothing. It could not even tell whether the picture represented an ox or a house. Miss Harriet just then came home, and she passed behind me just as I was holding out my canvas at arm's length, exhibiting it to our landlady. The demoniac could not help but see it, for I took care to exhibit the thing in such a way that it could not escape her notice. She stopped abruptly and stood motionless, astonished. It was her rock which was depicted, the one which she climbed to dream away her time undisturbed. She uttered a British oh, which was at once so accentuated and so flattering that I turned round to her smiling and said, This is my latest study, mademoiselle. She murmured rapturously, comically and tenderly, Oh, monsieur, you understand nature as a living thing. Well, I colored and was more touched by that compliment than if it had come from a queen. I was captured, conquered, and vanquished. I could have embraced her upon my honor. I took my seat at the table beside her as usual. For the first time, she spoke, thinking aloud. Oh, I do love nature. I passed her some bread and some water and some wine. She now accepted these with a the little smile of a mummy. And then I began to talk about the scenery. After the meal, we rose from the table together and walked leisurely across the courtyard. Then, attracted doubtless by the fiery glow which the setting sun cast over the surface of the sea, I opened the gates which led to the cliff, and we locked, walked along side by side, as contented as two persons who might be, whom I have just learned to understand and penetrate each other's motives and feelings. It was one of those warm, soft evenings which impart a sense of ease to flesh and spirit alike. All is enjoyment. Everything charms. The balmy air laden with the perfume of grasses and the smell of seaweed soothes the olfactory sense with its wild fragrance, soothes the palate and its sea savor, soothes the mind with its pervading sweetness. We were now walking along the edge of the cliff, high above the boundless sea which rolled its little waves below us at a distance of a hundred meters. And we drank in with open mouth and expanded chest that fresh breeze, briny from kissing the waves, that came from the ocean and passed across our faces. Wrapped in her plaid shawl with a look of inspiration as she faced the breeze, the Englishwoman gazed fixedly at the great sunball as it descended toward the horizon. Far off in the distance, a three-master in full sail was outlined in the blood-red sky, and a steamship somewhat nearer passed along, leaving behind it a trail of smoke on the horizon. The red sun globe sank slowly lower and lower and presently touched the water just behind the motionless vessel, which in its dazzling, dazzling effulgence looked as though framed in a flame of fire. We saw it plunge and grow smaller and disappear, swallowed up by the ocean. Miss Harriet gazed in rapture at the last gleams of the dying day. She seemed longing to embrace the sky, the sea, the whole landscape. She murmured, Oh, I love, I love, and I saw a tear in her eye. She continued, I wish I were little birds so that I could mount up into the firmament. She remained standing as I had often before seen her, perched on the cliff, her face as red as her shawl. I should have liked to sketch her in my album. It would have been a caricature of ecstasy. So I turned away so as not to laugh. I then spoke to her of painting as I would have done to a fellow artist, using the technical terms common among the devotees of the profession. She listened attentively, 
eagerly seeking to divine the meanings of the terms so as to understand my thoughts. From time to time she would exclaim, Oh, I understand. I understand. It's very interesting. We returned home. The next day, unseeing me, she approached me, cordially holding out her hand, and we at once became firm friends. She was a good creature who had a kind soul on springs, which became enthusiastic at a bound. She lacked equilibrium like all women who are spinsters at the age of fifty. She seemed to be preserved in a pickle of innocence, but her heart still retained something very youthful and inflammable. She loved both nature and animals with a fervor, a love like old wine fermented through age, with a sensuous love that she had never bestowed on men. One thing is certain, that the sight of a dog nursing her puppies, a mare roaming in a meadow with a foal at its side, a bird's nest full of young ones screaming with their open mouths and their enormous heads, affected her perceptibly. Poor, solitary, sad, wandering beings! I love you ever since I became acquainted with Miss Harriet's. I soon discovered that she had something that she'd like to tell me, but dare not, and I was amused at her timidity. When I stared out in the morning with my knapsack on my back, she would accompany me in silence as far as the end of the village, evidently struggling to find words with which to begin a conversation. Then she'd leave me abruptly and walk away quickly with her springy step. One day, however, she plucked up courage. I would like to see how you paint pictures. Are you willing? I've been very curious and she blushed as if she'd said something very audacious. I conducted her to the bottom of the Petit Val, where I'd begun a large picture. She remained standing behind me, following all my gestures with concentrated attention. Then, suddenly fearing perhaps she was disturbing me, she said, Thank you, and walked away. But she soon became more friendly and accompanied me every day, her countenance exhibiting visible pleasure. She carried her camp stool under her arm, not permitting me to carry it. She would remain there for hours, silent and motionless, following with her eyes the point of my brush in its every movement. When I obtained unexpectedly just the effect I wanted by a dash of color put on by the palette knife, she involuntarily uttered a little, ah, of astonishment, of joy, of admiration. She had the most tender respect for my canvases, and almost religious respect for that human reproduction as a part of nature's work divine. My studies appeared to her a kind of religious picture, and sometimes she spoke to me of God with the idea of converting me. Oh, he was a queer, good-natured being, this God of hers. He was a sort of village philosopher, without any great resources and without great power, for she always figured him to herself as inconsolable over injustices committed under his eyes, as though he were powerless to prevent them. She was, however, on excellent terms with him, affecting even to be the confidant of his secrets and of his troubles. She would say, God wills or God does not will, just like a sergeant announcing to a recruit. The colonel has commanded. At the bottom of her heart, she deplored my ignorance of the intentions of the eternal, which she endeavored to impart to me. Almost every day I found in my pockets and my hat when I lifted it from the ground, in my paint box or in my polished shoes, standing in front of my door in the morning, those little pious tracts, which she no doubt received directly from paradise. I treated her as one would an old friend, with unaffected cordiality. But I soon perceived that she changed somewhat in her manner, though for a while I paid little attention to it. When I was painting, whether in my valley or in some country lane, I would see her suddenly appear with her rapid springy walk. She would then sit down abruptly out of breath, as though she had been running or were overcome by some profound emotion. Her face would be red, that English red which is denied to the people of other countries. And then without any reason she would turn ashy pale and seem about to faint away. Gradually, however, her natural color would return, and she would begin to speak. Then, without warning, she'd break off in the middle of a sentence, springing up from her seat and walk away so rapidly and so strangely that I was at my wit's end to discover whether I'd done or said anything that would displease or wound her. I finally came to the conclusion that those were her normal manners, somewhat modified, no doubt, in my honor during the first days of our acquaintance. When she returned to the farm, after walking for hours on the windy coast, her long curls often hung straight down, as if their springs had been broken. This had hitherto seldom given her any concern, and she would come to dinner without embarrassment, all disheveled by her sister, the Breeze. But now she'd go to her room and arrange the untidy locks, and what I would say with familiar gallantly, gallantry, which, however, always offended her, Oh, you're as beautiful as a star today, Miss Harriet. A blush would immediately rise to her cheeks. The blush of a young girl, the girl of fifteen. Then she'd suddenly become quite reserved and cease coming to watch me paint. I thought, well, this is only a fit of temper. It'll blow over. But it did not always blow over. 
When I spoke to her, she would answer me either with an affected indifference or with sullen annoyance. She became by turns rude, impatient, and nervous. I never saw her now except at meals, and we spoke but little. I concluded at length that I must have offended her in some way, and accordingly I said to her one evening, Miss Harriet, why is it that you do not act towards me as formerly? What have I done to displease you? You are causing me much pain. She replied in a most comical tone of anger, I am just the same with you as formerly. It's not true. Not true. And she ran upstairs and shut herself up in her room. Occasionally she'd look at me in a peculiar manner. I've often said to myself since then that those who are condemned to death must look thus when they're informed that their last day has come. In her eye there lurked a species of insanity, an insanity once mystical and violent, and even more, a fever, an aggravated longing, impatient and impotent, for the unattained and unattainable. Nay, it seemed to me there was also going on with her a struggle in which her heart wrestled with an unknown force that she sought to master, and even perhaps something else. But what do I know? What do I know? It was indeed a singular revelation. For some time I had commenced to work, and as soon as daylight appeared, on a picture of the subject which was as follows. A deep ravine, enclosed and surmounted by two thickets of trees and vines, extended into the distance and was lost, submerged in that milky vapor, in that cloud like cotton down sometimes floats over valleys at daybreak. And at the extreme end of that heavy transparent fog, one saw, or rather surmised, that a couple of human beings were approaching. A human couple, a youth and a maiden, their arms interlaced and embracing each other, their heads inclined towards each other, and their lips meeting. A first ray of the sun glistening through the branches pierced that fog of the dawn, illuminated it with rosy reflection just behind the rustic lovers, framing their vague shadows in a silvery black background. It was well done. Yes, indeed, well done. I was working on the declivity which led to the Valley of Atrats. On this particular morning, I had by chance a sort of floating vapor which I needed. Suddenly something rose up in front of me like a phantom. It was Miss Harriet. On seeing me, she was about to flee, but I called after her, saying, Come here, come here, mademoiselle. I have a nice little picture for you. She came forward, though with seeming reluctance. I handed her my sketch. She said nothing, but stood a long time motionless, looking at it, and suddenly she burst into tears. She wept spasmodically like men who striven hard to restrain their tears, but who can do so no longer, and abandon themselves to grief, though still resisting. I sprang to my feet, moved at the sight of a sorrow I did not comprehend, and I took her by the hand with an impulse of brusque affection, a true French impulse, which acts before it reflects. She let her hands rest in mine for a few seconds, and I felt them quiver as if all her nerves were being wrenched. Then she withdrew her hands abruptly, or rather snatched them away. I recognized the tremor, for I had felt it, and I could not be deceived. Ah, the love tremor of a woman, whether she be fifteen or fifty years of age, whether she be of the people or of society, goes so straight to my heart that I never have any hesitation in understanding it. Her whole frail being had trembled, vibrated, been overcome. I knew it. She walked away before I had time to say a word, leaving me as surprised as if I had witnessed a miracle, and as troubled as if I had committed a crime. I did not go in to breakfast. I went to take a turn on the edge of the cliff, feeling that I had just as leaf weep and laugh and looking on the adventure as both comic and deplorable, and as my position as ridiculous, believing her unhappy enough to go insane. I asked myself what I ought to do. It seemed best for me to leave the place, and I immediately resolved to do so. Somewhat sad and perplexed, I wandered about until dinner time and entered the farmhouse just when the soup had been served up. I sat down at the table as usual. Miss Harriet was there eating away solemnly, without speaking to anyone, without even lifting her eyes. Her manner and expression were, however, the same as usual. I waited patiently till the meal had been finished, when turning toward the landlady I said, Well, Madame Le Cachure, I will not be long now before I shall have to take my leave of you. The good woman, at once surprised and troubled, replied in her drawling voice, My dear sir, what is it you say? You're going to leave us after I've become so accustomed to you. I glanced at Miss Harriet out of the corner of my eye. Her countenance did not change in the least. But Celeste, the little servant, looked up at me. She was a fat girl of about eighteen years of age, rosy and fresh and as strong as a horse, and possessing the rare attribute of cleanliness. I had kissed her at odd times in out-of-the-way corners, after the manner of travelers, and nothing more. The dinner being at length over, I went to smoke my pipe under the apple trees, walking up and down from one end of the enclosure to the other. 
all the reflections which I had made during the day, the strange discovery of the morning, that passionate and grotesque attachment for me, the recollections which that revelation had suddenly called up, recollections at once charming and perplexing, perhaps also that look which the servant had cast upon me at the announcement of my departure. All of these things, mixed up and combined, put me now in a reckless humor, and gave me a tickling sensation of kisses on the lips, and in my veins something which urged me on to commit some folly. Night was coming on, casting its dark shadows under the trees, when I descried Celeste, who had gone to fasten up the poultry yard at the other end of the enclosure. I darted towards her, running so noiselessly that she heard nothing, and as she got up from closing the small trap door by which the chickens got in and out, I clasped her in my arms and rained on her coarse, fat face a shower of kisses. She struggled, laughing all the time as she was accustomed to do so in such circumstances. Why did I suddenly loose my grip of her? Why did I at once experience a shock? What was it that I heard behind me? It was Miss Harriet who had come upon us, who had seen us and who stood in front of us motionless as a specter. Then she disappeared in the darkness. I was ashamed, embarrassed, and more desperate at having been thus surprised by her than if she had caught me committing some criminal act. I slept badly that night. I was completely unnerved and haunted by sad thoughts. I seemed to hear loud weeping, but in this I was no doubt deceived. Moreover, I thought several times I heard someone walking up and down in the house and opening the hall door. Toward morning I was overcome by fatigue and fell asleep. I got up late and did not go downstairs until the late breakfast, being still in a bewildered state and not knowing what kind of expression to put on. No one had seen Miss Harriet. We waited for her at table, but she did not appear. At length, Mother Lecashur went to her room. The Englishwoman had gone out. She must have set out at break of day as she was wont to do in order to see the sun rise. Nobody seemed surprised at this, and we all began to eat in silence. The weather was hot, very hot, one of those broiling heavy days when not a leaf stirs. The table had been placed out of doors under an apple tree, and from time to time, support had gone to the cellar to draw a jug of cider. Everybody was so thirsty. Celeste brought the dishes from the kitchen, a a ragu of mutton with potatoes and a cold rabbit and a salad. Afterward, she placed before us a dish of strawberries, the first of the season. As I wished to wash and freshen these, I begged the servant to go and draw me a pitcher of cold water. In about five minutes, she returned, declaring that the well was dry. She had lowered the pitcher to the full extent of the cord and had touched the bottom, but on drawing the pitcher up again, it was empty. While Mother Lacassure, anxious to examine the thing for herself, went and looked down the hole. She returned, announcing that one could clearly see something in the well, something altogether unusual, but this, no doubt, was bundles of straw, which a neighbor had thrown in out of spite. I wished to look down the well also, hoping I might be able to clear up the mystery, and I perched myself close to the brink. I perceived indistinctly a white object, What could it be? I then conceived the idea of lowering a lantern at the end of a cord. When I did so, the yellow flame danced on the layers of some stone and gradually became clearer. All four of us were leaning over the opening, Sapur and Celeste having now joined us. The lantern rested on the black and white indistinct mass, singular and incomprehensible. Sapur exclaimed, It's a horse! I see the hoofs! It must have gotten out of the meadow during the night and fallen in headlong. But suddenly a cold shiver froze me to the marrow. I first recognized a foot, then a leg sticking up. The whole body and the other leg were completely underwater. I stammered out in a loud voice, trembling so violently that the lantern danced hither and thither over the slipper. It's a woman! Who can it be? It's Miss Harriet! Sapur alone did not manifest horror. He'd witnessed many such a scene in Africa. Mother Lecashur and Celeste began to utter piercing screams and ran away. But it was necessary to recover the corpse of the dead woman. I attached the young man securely by the waist to the end of the pulley rope and lowered him in very slowly, watching him disappear in the darkness. In one hand, he held the lantern in a rope and in another. Soon I recognized his voice, which seemed to come from the center of the earth, saying, Stop! I then saw him fish something out of the water. It was the other leg. He then bound the two feet together and shouted anew, Haul up! I began to wind up, but I felt my arms crack, my muscles twitch, and I was in terror lest I should let the man fall to the bottom. When his head appeared at the brink, I asked, Well? As if I expected he had a message from the drowned woman. We both got on the stone slab at the edge of the well, and from the opposite sides, we began to haul up the body. Mother Lecashur and Celeste watched us from a distance, concealed from view behind the wall of the house. When they saw issuing from the hole the black slippers and the white stockings of the drowned person, they disappeared. Super seized the ankles and we drew up the body of the poor woman. The head was shocking to look at, being bruised and lacerated in a long gray hair out of curl forevermore, hanging down tangled and disordered. 
In the name of all that's holy, how lean she is, exclaimed Sapur in a contemptuous tone. We carried her into the room, and as the women did not put on an appearance, I, with the assistance of the stable lad, dressed the corpse for burial. I washed her disfigured face. Under the touch of my finger, an eye was slightly opened and regarded me with that pale, cold look, that terrible look of a corpse which seems to come from the beyond. I braided as well as I could her disheveled hair, and with my clumsy hands arranged on her head a novel and singular coiffure. Then I took off her dripping wet garments, burying, not without a feeling of shame, as though I had been guilty of some profanation, her shoulders and her chest and her long arms, as slim as the twigs of a tree. I next went to fetch some flowers, poppies, bluets, marguerites, and fresh sweet-smelling grass with which to strew her funeral couch. I then had to go through the usual formalities, as I was alone to attend to everything. A letter found in her pocket, written at the last moment, requested that her body be buried in the village which she had passed the last days of her life. A sad suspicion weighed on my heart. Was it not on my account that she wished to be laid to rest in this place? Toward evening, all the female gossips of the locality came to view the remains of the defunct, but I would not allow a single person to enter. I wanted to be alone, and I watched beside her all night. I looked at the corpse by the flickering light of the candles, at this unhappy woman, unknown to us all, who had died in such a lamentable manner and so far away from home. Had she left no friends, no relations behind her? What had her infancy been? What had been her life? Whence had she come thither alone, a wanderer lost like a dog driven from home? What secrets of sufferings and of despair were sealed up in that unprepossessing body, in that poor body whose outward appearance had driven from her all affection and all love? How many unhappy beings there are! I felt that there weighed upon that human creature the eternal injustice of implacable nature. It was all over with her, without her ever having experienced, perhaps, that which sustains the greatest outcasts to wit, the hope of being loved once. Otherwise, why should she thus have concealed herself, fled from the face of others? Why did she love everything so tenderly and so passionately, everything living that was not a man? I recognized the fact that she believed in a god, and that she hoped to receive compensation from the latter for all the miseries she had endured. She would now disintegrate and become, in turn, a plant. She would blossom in the sun, and the cattle would browse on her leaves, the birds would bear away the seeds, and through these changes she would become again human flesh. But that which is called the soul had been extinguished at the bottom of the dark well. She suffered no longer. She had given her life for that of others yet to come. Hours passed away in this silent and sinister communication with the dead. A pale light at length announced the dawn of a new day, and then a red ray streamed in on the bed, making a bar of light across the coverlet and across her hands. This was the hour she had so much loved. The awakened birds began to sing in the trees. I opened the window to its fullest extent and drew back the curtains that the whole heavens might look in upon us, and bending over the icy corpse, I took in my hands the mutilated head and slowly, without terror or disgust, I imprinted a kiss, a long kiss upon those lips which had never before been kissed. Leon Chanel remained silent. The women wept. We heard on the box seat the Count d'Altrail blowing his nose from time to time. The coachman alone had gone to sleep. The horses, who no longer felt the sting of the whip, had slackened their pace and moved along slowly. The drag, hardly advancing at all, seemed suddenly torpid, as if it had been freighted with sorrow.